Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jay Sexton, uh, professor of history here at the Kinder Institute of Constitutional Democracy. Um, and I see the, the, the numbers are, are trickling in. We're expecting a, a, good, a good audience. Um, and the good news for those who might be coming in just a little bit late is um, my rambles will be at the beginning, and then we'll pivot um, to the people that you really want to hear from, uh, because we're in uh, for a real treat today. Uh, we have uh, four of the smartest folks on the planet um, here uh, to help us make sense of our current, uh, of our current moment. Um, my job is to introduce and then to uh, moderate the discussion. Uh, I've likened this uh, to, to the role of being the pitcher at a home run derby in the days of Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. And I don't know if that means anything to our, um, our foreign uh, scholars here, but Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, home run derby, pitcher just needed to throw it up and watch them crank it out of the park. Uh, so good were those home run hitters. Um, so before I introduce them though, I do wanna say a few words um, about why we're here today. A few words maybe more generally about where we find ourselves in the United States. Um, in the aftermath of what has been a contentious, indeed, what's been a violent um, election cycle here. And, and, and here's the headline, or what I see to be the headline. And the headline is that Americans ha have never been clearer as to where we stand, um, nor at the same time have we ever had less of a clue as to where we stand. Um, so what do we know? Where do we know where we stand? Well, pretty much every American, I'm assuming all of you, most of you on, the, on this call, know where you stand in terms of domestic politics and culture wars. You know that you're a Democrat or a Republican. You know you're for reproductive rights or you oppose uh, abortion. You supported the impeachments of Trump or you stood by the former president. Um, what's more is that you'll even probably likely signal your political orientation, signal it through your appearance, through the stuff that you buy um, and the television that you consume. Your social network is probably increasingly comprised of the like-minded. Um, and your politics, your politics might even determine which family member you sit by at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, a half century long process of political sorting has arrived um, at its terminal destination, or one hopes it's its terminal destination, and it ain't a pretty place, um, as the storming of the Capitol uh, back in January made clear. So this is what I mean when I say we know where we stand. And yet, from a different vantage, Americans have never known less about where we stand. And here I mean where we stand within a fast-changing world. Um, if the domestic trend line of our times is one of inexorably advancing polarization, um, the global narrative is much more confusing, much more difficult to get our heads around. It's a narrative of head spinning change um, that has not moved in a clear direction. Uh, ours is an era of international volatility, of sudden lurches in how America fits into the wider world and of changes in how different societies structure their power, organize their economies, and relate to one another. And just think about how much like political bandwidth is consumed in the United States by our domestic tribal warfare um, in relation to how little of it is filled with learning about the rest of the world and thinking about how we ought to navigate our way through these turbulent times. Think about how a frightening majority of Americans, and I include in this a really smart Americans, I even include some of our political leaders, but think about how they cannot locate major countries on a map. That they don't have a, a remedial understanding of even basic world news stories. That they don't understand a word of a foreign language. That they don't even know which countries are our allies and which ones are our rivals. And this is crazy. It's crazy because the challenges uh, we confront are global in nature. Let me just give you a few examples. First, the coronavirus, um, our biggest immediate threat, and climate change, our biggest long-term threat, pay zero attention to national borders. Second example, racism, a massive, seemingly intractable American problem 
But it's more than that. It's more than a national problem. It's a global problem whose origins trace back to centuries of colonialism, transatlantic slavery, and early globalization. Any reckoning um, on the racial questions confronting us, and it might well be that a national unit is the best unit to conduct such a reckoning, but any reckoning must grapple with international dimensions and legacies. Third example, the dizzying economic and technological changes of our time. These are disrupting societies around the globe, not just the United States. What we've seen here, uh, we've seen deindustrialization, we've seen digitization. Um, what we're seeing here is but a site specific manifestation of a much broader trend of economic globalization. Um, and then fourth and finally, the last example, social and political movements of our era um, are increasingly transnational across national in nature. Think of the global protests that followed the murder of George Floyd over the summer. Think of the global protests linked to the fight for freedom in Hong Kong. Think of the Me Too movement calling out of a sexual assault and gender discrimination. Think of the challenge to constitutional democracy from authoritarianism. All of these developments are being played out simultaneously across space and across borders. So I could keep going, but I'm sure that you've got my point. The challenges confronting the United States are global in nature. And the wager of this event is that we have much to learn from other societies, including things about how the United States itself relates to the wider world, including things actually about us. Which brings me back to our panelists, our four sluggers today. Um, their, their task that was set for them is to uh, share some thoughts on a set of questions building out from the 2020 election. So we've asked them, how have people where you're at um, interpreted the recent US election crisis? Um, what are the challenges to constitutional democracy that your home societies are confronting? And how have your countries, indeed, how have your regions um, sought to make their way through these uh, volatile times? Each of our panelists is going to speak for about five minutes um, on, the, on this general issue. Then I'm going to follow up with each of them individually with one question, and they'll have another five minutes. Um, but don't be passive, listeners. As you're listening, be engaged in this and start typing in your questions um, into the Zoom chat. Um, and I'll be making my way through the questions, as will my um, colleague here in the Mizzou History Department, Cindy Ewing. Um, who's a, a new addition to the department. We're, we're very delighted to have her. She's a, a distinguished international historian of Asia here. And Cindy will help me and I'll help her. We'll dig through your questions um, and then we'll pose them, as many of them as we can, um, to the presenters. So start those questions coming early um, and often. Now to the um, uh, panelists, now to the introductions, the batting order, the batting order in the lineup. We're going to start off with Erica Pani from the Center of Historical Studies at the College of Mexico in Mexico City. Erica has a huge advantage today. It is central standard time for her. So she's operating in the same time zone as are we. Um, and she also, I think, understands baseball metaphors because I think she's a, somewhat of a baseball fan. But uh, Erica is a leading authority on the political history of Mexico, uh, particularly the 19th century. She's just published a book in Spanish on uh, the history of Mexico entitled Nation, Constitution, and Reform. Um, welcome, Erica. Thank you for being here. Then next in the lineup, next, um, it, we're going to move down to Cape, to, to South Africa, actually, to South Africa, Becky Mungamezulu, um, who's beaming in from South Africa. Becky it is late at night for him. It is 11.30 p.m. Um, so we're grateful for him staying up late. Uh, Becky's a political scientist at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, that's an institution with which Missouri has a long, uh, venerable connection. Um, he's a distinguished scholar. His list of publications could reach from Cape Town all the way here to Missouri. Uh, but the most recent ones, and the ones that are relevant, I think, for tonight, um, have focused on post-apartheid South Africa, on African perspectives on international relations, 
and the decolonization of the political science curriculum. So welcome, Becky. Thank you, um, thank you. Great. The third is uh, Adam Smith, third in the lineups. Adam Smith, Edward Orsborn Chair and Director of the Rother Mayor American Institute at Oxford University. Um, it's just past uh, 9.30 p.m. for Adam. I think this is actually when he's at his best about this time in the evening. Um, and, and he's always at his best, really, because there's no more astute observer of the political histories of the United States and, and Great Britain than, than Adam, nor is there a warmer supporter of the Kinder uh, Institute programs that we run through Oxford and we're grateful for. Uh, many of you might remember his lecture here in Jesse Hall a couple years back when he launched his most recent book uh, entitled The Stormy Present, Conservatism and the Problem of Slavery. Um, you should read that one. You should also check out his uh, great podcast on doing American history in Britain called The Last Best Hope. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, Jen. And then uh, batting cleanup, fourth in the batting uh, order, last is uh, Fumiko Nishizaki, uh, emeritus professor at the University of Tokyo. And uh, Fumiko is going to go last in the batting order to give her time to, to drink a cup of green tea because it's 6.42 a.m. in the morning across the Pacific. And indeed, it's Saturday morning. She's doing this on a Saturday morning, so we're very grateful. Uh, Fumiko is an expert on international affairs in the 20th century. She's written perceptively on, on U.S. foreign relations, the United Nations, and trans-Pacific affairs. Um, I know her as a, a passionate critic of militarism in all of its forms, um, as well as an authority on the history of the special relationship between the United States and Japan. Um, welcome, Fumiko, great to have you here. Okay, enough for me. Uh, let's turn it over to Erica. Erica, what, what's the picture look like from down there? Thank you, Jay. After that introduction, I am very scared of striking out. <laughs> um, so I, January 6th was one of those moments where, you know, like when Kennedy was assassinated, that we will talk about for years and people will say, you know, what were you doing when this all was going down? Uh, and I think that this was for Mexicans interested in the US and we have to kind of obsessively be, you know, uh, very interested in what goes on with, uh, with our neighbor. It was shocking, very shocking, I would say, but not surprising. You know? We had been witnessing for months a president who was constantly denouncing fraud, saying that it was going to be a rigged election. Um, I think with my students, we were actually surprised that there was not more violence in the buildup to the election. People who were dropping off ballots, early voting, um, even on on November on November eighth. And then to see this uh, taking over the Capitol was, was surprising, but again, not, not, I mean, shocking, but not, but not surprising, especially since we always think of the US as being kind of a victim of its own success. Now so we who lived with a hegemonic party um, system for most of the 20th century have a very robust, reliable system, very expensive also, uh, of uh, guaranteeing clean elections uh, that are independent of the government um, at both the local and the end of the federal level, et cetera. The US doesn't really have a mechanism that is centralized that will solve, that will speak the truth to whatever it is that happened, that will solve controversies. So um, we, we, we were uh, very worried about the the post you know, election being a mess. Uh, seeing the judicial decisions was very, uh, we, we were made us more optimistic and then having this thing happen on, on January 6th, uh, found it a little disconcerting, you know, CNN saying, oh, we think we're reporting from the streets of Bogota, um, especially since doesn't, this, this didn't take into account the role that the US has played in Latin American uh, coup d'etats you know, throughout the second half of, of the 20th century. So it was a little like the Cold War chickens come home to roost 
dressed up as these very strange looking, uh, these very strange looking uh, birds. And then the fact that it just wasn't clear what was going on, you know, was this really a coup d'etat? And I think that the fact that the military, that the armed forces were not there, they were not there to a fault, you know, uh, compared to what we had seen in, in the summer and how the National Guard had been displayed uh, in, different, in different cities across the US. The fact that the uh, Capitol Police were overpowered almost immediately and that the army was nowhere to be seen. So that, I, I think it, it was a relief that it was not you know, an armed takeover uh, by, by professional soldiers of the Capitol, but still um, kind of strange. So uh, I think that what we are left with is an image of the US as not really realizing, especially with what was discussed for the second impeachment, not realizing how close it came to things going up um, in flames and uh, not being sure of there being the critical mass that is needed to, I think, set things in order, not to put reason and uh, conciliation in, at the center of politics and not this very performative kind of ridiculous um, politics that I think have, have, are now the norm um, in the US. Now this whole ridiculous thing about Dr. Seuss and Mr. Potato Head, what can I tell you? Things do not look good from south of the border. Okay, th th thank you for that, Erica. Um, Becky. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I must say that uh, the 2020 uh, election in the US has painted a different picture uh, for South Africans from the picture they used to have before then. Uh, as we recall that South Africa became a democratic country in 1994, and we looked up to America and wanted to emulate America as one of the old democracies. And as a matter of fact, uh, we tried our best to do just that. We had um, a, a liberal constitution which we adopted in 1996, and everything that we did was in fact meant to consolidate our democracy. We even put some institutions in place uh, in order to ensure that our democracy was consolidated. Then in 2000, coincidentally, I was in the US at the time, I was at Rice University at the time, and I was teasing my friends from Florida. I was saying, you guys have been having elections for some years, but you can't count. What's the problem? And they were laughing at me. But then at least that one was light uh, when Al Gore and uh, George W. Bush were we're winning, one would win Florida today, then tomorrow, no, no, no. In fact, Al Gore has won. So that was a joke. Come 2016, uh, the battle between um, uh, uh, President Trump and uh, uh, of course, uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, one thing that confused South Africans was this electoral college, uh, a big animal. Up to now, they, I, I, I'm at pains trying to explain how it works because you, you will be told that Hillary Clinton won uh, the popular vote, but then Donald Trump was declared the president. They said, no, this just can't be. But you said America is a democratic country. How democratic is that? If the majority of Americans voted for Hillary Clinton, how on earth does Donald Trump then become a president? Then I had to explain to them how the college system operates. But honestly speaking, the 2020 election, uh, I would say that America dropped the ball. And the South Africans, the majority of South Africans are totally disappointed. On the build up to the election, there was no presidential debate. What was said to be a presidential debate was in fact a disaster. And uh, you would see that uh, it was as if you were in a bar wherein uh, you have people talking at the top of their voices, each one wanting to outdo the other one. It was a crazy, a crazy thing. And we thought uh, the Berkeley uh, was over when in fact the Berkeley just started. Because um, after the election, then of course, uh, uh, some of us knew that uh, uh, Biden was going to win the election. I remember uh, having some discussions with a number of students and a number of other 
a political analyst like myself, and we're saying that uh, uh, the writing is on the wall, that Joe Biden is going to win this election. And others were saying, no, if he wins, then uh, President Trump is going to cry foul. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, what, what, what became more interesting was that on the day of the elections, uh, President Trump went public saying that he had won the election. And then some of us said, was President Trump fast asleep and just woke up and he thought he had won an election? How do you win an election even before counting is started? So that was a recipe for disaster. So what happened then post-election did not come as a surprise because there'd been a build up to that. So South Africans were disappointed because as I said at the beginning, uh, we wanted to emulate America as one of the old democracies. And what we, we expected a situation whereby the elections would be free, fair and credible. And then where the loser would uh, exit the stage in a graceful manner, concede defeat and then leave the White House. But what you saw happening was unprecedented. And for the very first time, we saw a violence, post-election violence. The African continent is known for this. Uh, Kenya is one typical example where a number of people lost their lives after an election, and there, there are quite a number of others. But we didn't expect this, as South Africans, we didn't expect this from America. When this happened, it took people by surprise. So right now, I would say that uh, the image that South Africans had of America as one of the old democracies has gone down. So now I think that as Joe Biden uh, takes over as the new president, the onus is now on him to bring back the reputation uh, that America had. Uh, in the multilateral stage, I would say that uh, under Barack Obama, South Africans were happy when uh, America mended the wall as it were with countries like Cuba, uh, countries like um, and North, uh, and North Korea. So they were saying that, okay, America now is in fact embracing multilateralism. But then under President Donald Trump, all of that disappeared. So then uh, uh, South Africans were shocked. They were saying, we expect Americans to take the lead. What has gone wrong with the president? And then when this thing happened with the elections, of course, then uh, South Africans were really disappointed. So I would say the long and short of it, all the gains uh, that Americans had made uh, in the hearts of South Africans disappeared. And we're hoping that uh, time is ripe for uh, President Biden to then revive uh, that particular hope and then bring back uh, the trust and the respect that uh, America used to have in the hearts of many South Africans. Thanks, Becky. And another sobering assessment there. Um, Adam, what, what's it look like from where you sit? Well, um, I suppose the, the first general contextual point that people need to understand is that um, the uh, British political and media elites are completely obsessed with American politics. So your average journalist, member of parliament, academic, um, most people I know, myself included, would without question be able to tell you who the House Minority Leader was, they'd be able to give you a good stab at what reconciliation meant, but they'd really struggle to tell you who was likely to take over from Angela Merkel as the most powerful person in Europe. There's a disproportionate obsession with the microscopic details of American politics among British media elites. And that you might think of as a subset of the total interpenetration of British culture by the United States, which is obviously a long story, a century long story really, but which is intensified in the era of social media and in the world of Netflix that we're now living in. Um, so in that sense, I wouldn't say that um, the, 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 the picture that we've just heard from Becky would not be one that I, I think will be generally recognized in this country because there's, there's so much, there was so much more anticipation that this was going to be a dramatic and tense uh, election. Um, as Erica said, I mean, there was almost a sense of expectation there would be something, there would be a great, you know, the, the next series, the next episode in the series of American politics was bound to feature some kind of crescendo as it did. But then the story keeps rolling on, right? So Trump, I mean, Pew surveys of, um, 
uh, opinion around the world show that Britain was one of the countries with the way in which Donald Trump had the lowest approval rating. Within Europe, he had a high approval ratings in Russia, wonder why that might be, and in Poland and in Hungary and in Israel for reasons that we can, and I know Israel isn't in Europe, sorry, but just within the kind of, um, and, uh, but very low in Britain, even among conservatives. I mean, you know, he was not a popular person across the entire political spectrum. The only prominent figure in Britain I can think of who was, was openly pro-Trump was Nigel Farage, the right-wing populist who championed um, Brexit. Nobody else, not even conservatives, not even Boris Johnson, the prime minister who's often linked and likened to um, Donald Trump. He's played his cards very close to his chest about whether he really likes Trump or not. So in that sense, because Trump was so massively unpopular, Barack Obama had before him, of course, had been so incredibly popular. There is also now, with the next episode of the series rolls along, and Joe Biden, who kind of sounds like an old cowboy in a Western movie, gets sworn in, and the British political class swoon, because here is a kind of old-style progressive president who talks about alliances, and, you know, suddenly the story just keeps rolling on, as I say, and there are sunlit uplands possibly ahead. Um, so, you know, and all this within the context of, um, you know, ever since, I guess you could say 1916, um, the one, the one single central sticking point in British geopolitical thinking has been dependence on a hope for a faith in an alliance with the United States. And they haven't always got it, of course, didn't get it in the 20s and 30s. There were some wobbly moments with Vietnam. Um, even under Barack Obama, who clearly wasn't that interested in, you know, the, old, the what British people always call the special relationship, the US UK special relationship. Obama wasn't as a sort of Pacific turn worries there, but still Obama was obviously an old style multilateralist. Trump terrifying a figure from all that point of view. So there's now renewed hope again that with Biden, we can kind of resume, Britain can resume what it always wants, which is to be the United States closest friend. But at the same time, because of Trump and because of the election or because of the violence and the polarization, there's always this sense that there's probably now there's going to be another Trump round the corner. And so alongside the obsession and the fascination with American politics is this deep, deep, deep anxiety that everything is going to explode and go really, really badly wrong. Well, I thought you were going to end on a high point, but then another sobering, another sobering uh, but uh, understandable conclusion there. OK, um, Fumiko. OK, thanks. Um... Let me start by saying that in Japan, the image of the United States has always been conflicted and it applies to the, this current election as well. On the one hand, the election itself, as Erica was saying, was surprisingly orderly, uh, demonstrating the resilience of US institutions. On the other hand, Trump's denial of, the, of his defeat and the storming of the Capitol was horrifying to watch. And yet again, watching congressional hearings on the crisis on TV, we are impressed once again with the, in the investigative power of the Congress. So, so there's always the, the pros and cons. Um, but the point that I want to make today pertains to a, a little bit longer uh, impact of Trump presidency on Japan, because I believe Trump's presidency throws into sharp relief, what has been happening in Japan, in Japanese politics for quite a while. So I'll, I'll be talking more about Japan. Um, but uh, this may sound, seem an overstatement since differences between US and Japan are more apparent than similarities. There's no imminent threat of domestic terrorism in Japan. Um, elections are orderly and predictable to the point of boredom and nobody claims delusionary victory. And yet political legitimacy, which I believe is the bedrock of constitutional democracy, has been increasingly threatened in Japan as in the United States. And I, I should add that this is my personal <laughs> view of Japanese politics, and I don't claim to represent Japanese, uh, <laughs> the Japanese people uh, as a whole. Um, but there are several points that I would like to make. and. Uh, the first is persistent undermining of the, the rule of law in Japan. Um, here I should remind you that in Japan, the constitution is fiercely contested. 
its emphasis on pacifism and, and human rights is regarded as a left liberal cause. And the LDP, the majority party, has made it uh, its raison d'etre to revise it. Mm. And unable to pull it off, uh, the LDP has tried to undermine it whenever possible. That raises the problem of legal stability in Japanese politics. Uh, for example, when pushing for a security bill in 2015, Prime Minister Abe nonchalantly, but intentionally, broke with traditional interpretation of Article 9, which foreswore Japan's right to collective self-defense. So such drastic departure from the precedent can be damaging to legal stability. And there are many, there have been many other examples. And, this, and second is the abuse of power in personnel affairs. Um, in Japan, a po powerful bureaucracy has been regarded as a major obstacle to political reform. Um, in order to deal with the problem, L LDP established the cabinet personnel bureau drastically particularly increasing the power of politicians over bureaucrats, a bureaucratic appointment. This had, has had a fundamentally corrosive effect on political legitimacy. Leading politicians, including current prime minister, unabashedly used the power to, to reward and punish to promote their agenda and, and demoralize bureaucrats, increasingly bending laws to please politicians. Um, instead of telling them what can and cannot be done. Um, here again, one difference between the US and Japan is the investigative power of the legislator, legislature. The firing of James Comey and DOJ's stonewalling of the Mueller report was outrageous, uh, but congressional investigations revealed the integrity and expertise of the diplomatic and intelligence office, officers and the power of Congress as well which is lacking in, in Japan. And the third point that I would like to po uh, point out is the use of obf obfuscating language in politics. In Japanese politics, being prosaic is more valued than being responsive to the public. Um, political dialogue is filled with brusque replies and platitudes, especially in the diet. Only when talking with their supporters, politicians start to tell it like it is. Um, that obviously was the case with former Prime Minister Mori, uh, whose sexist gaffe became an international news. Again, there's a difference between provocative language used by Trump and his supporters and the uh, cliche written speeches of Japanese politicians. Mm -hmm. But either way, they undermine public trust in the government. So to conclude, despite differences, similarities are more significant. The crucial element in constitutional democracies by limiting the power of the government, its authority is accepted as legitimate. By blat blatantly ignoring those limits, Trump posed a grave threat to constitutional democracy. But in the US, there have been intense debates over his behavior in Congress and the media. In contrast, in Japan, challenges against constitutional democracy have been going on rather subtly, and public res response is muted. So for us in Japan, it is important to be shocked by what's happening in the US, but at the same time to ask ourselves whether or not we are heading in the same direction, uh, taking different paths. That's my take. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Fumika. Very, very subtle analysis there. Fantastic. Guys, get the questions coming into the thing. We're going to go around the horn one more time, and then we're going to uh, turn it over to uh, to the audience for their questions. So please, please put those in the in the chat room. Uh, but until then, I want, I want to go back. I want to start with you, Erica. Um, and obviously a, a big issue um, in, the, in the Trump campaigns, but a big issue in American politics in recent years has been about um, hemispheric uh, trade agreements. It's obviously been about migration. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how those issues um, have played out within Mexican politics, um, not necessarily how the United States is determined, what do Mexicans think about these issues? And more generally, what, what, sort, of, um, what sort of relationship um, does Mexico want to develop with the United States uh, moving forward? Um, that's it, a very interesting question, Jay. Um, on the one hand, um, we 
Mexico, its political elites, its, its um, opinion makers were deeply hurt. We also think we have a special relationship with the states. So we're deeply hurt that Mexico was used as this piñata during the Trump campaign. Uh, and then we were in some ways pleasantly surprised that the Mexican government, which is a leftist government, which is usually you know, tends towards an anti-American, anti-Yankee rhetoric, anti-free trade, decided that the free trade agreement was a central part of Mexico's future. Uh, so I think that, that there we have something where we can both, both countries and with the stabilizing, I think, influence of Canada, uh, create a common ground. Uh, there's a big conflict right now because uh, our president has decided that we need to go back to an energy policy from the 1970s which a lot of, of, of people are pointing out goes against what was agreed to in the USMCA. Uh, so I think that it is a good thing that a free, the free trade agreement, which already has an infrastructure that works uh, both on the ground in terms of production chains and institutionally in terms of, of mechanisms to resolve uh, controversies, I think my discipline, public policy in Mexico, in terms of uh, climate change policy, which we, our government kind of doesn't believe in, uh, and in terms of labor uh, uh, rights and minimum salaries, et cetera. No, the, the fact that um, these were things that were tweaked in the new, in the new agreement will, will, I think, eventually be healthy. Uh, for Mexico. The immigration situation, I think, is very, uh, very worrisome, uh, not only for Mexican migrants, but for those who go uh, across Mexico in situations that are not safe um, in order to, to get into the U.S. And there, I think that there is this hope. Uh, I think Biden is perceived as fragile. Um, Kamala Harris is kind of an unknown uh, quantity. She's, you know, it's rumored that she doesn't like Mexico, that she doesn't like the free trade agreement, et cetera, that she voted against it. Uh, but I do think that um, we will go back to the old mechanisms of separating different issues, no, not, not threatening tariffs if you don't do something about immigration, uh, about controlling the border to the south and then the border with the US. Uh, so what I'm hoping is for a more realistic um, management of, of immigration that both creates a path for citizenship for the five, six million undocumented, undocumented Mexicans who live in the States and who contribute to the Mexican economy. More dollars come in from remittances than they do from oil sales from Pemex. Um, and then a, a rational management of that is out in the open, that has institutions to answer for what is done on the ground uh, in both Mexico and the US. Mexico, here I, I, I blame Mexico more than I blame the US. No? We treat, even though we are an immigrant nation, we treat immigrants as if you know, it's just completely unacceptable. Um, and then the other thing is, is the war on drugs, which has unleashed this horrible violence in Mexico for over, <clears throat> I'm sorry, for over 10 years, which is if the market is in the US, no? So what do we do with the war on drugs when um, if the US is not willing to give up on this uh, punitive, uh, trying to discipline other uh, either countries that are either producing or, or um, shipping um, gun violence that most of the guns come from the US. Uh, what worries me is in both 
of these of these areas, these are issues that have a lot of political traction in the US. So I think that realistic approaches to solving these problems collaboratively are difficult when you can, you know, raise a flag uh, that will be provoke great scandals among among certain voters. Um, so we will just have to see. Okay, th th thanks for that, Erica. Um, uh, Becky, so you, you mentioned um, the, the 1990s constitutions um, in South Africa and the, the onset of democracy. Of course, this is in the context of the uh, dismantling of the racial segregation system in South Africa. And I, I wondered um, what sort of lessons that uh, Americans might take from South Africa's experience of dealing with um, the legacies of racial inequality as we, as we confront our own um, a moment to sort of racial reckoning here? No, th thank you very much for that question. I think uh, for me, if one is sick, uh, the first step towards recovery is to admit that you are sick. Uh, only then can somebody come up with a cure. Uh, as long as you uh, don't agree that there is racism, there will be no attempt to try and uproot it. I think in South Africa, uh, we did two things at the same time. One, we admitted that uh, there was racism because the apartheid system was a terrible system, which was built on racism. In fact, 1948, it was a matter of uh, taking whatever was there as segregation, and then you consolidated it, and then you made it a government policy, and then racism became a government policy. So then in 1994, with the adoption of this 1996 constitution, we were trying to dismantle that. We agree that uh, there is racism in South Africa, then let's find a way of addressing it. And then under the new political dispensation from 1994, there were a couple of things that happened. Legislation it was enacted, uh, your, your Labor Relations Act, in fact, uh, was meant to make sure that everyone is equal before the law. And then we had a number of other institutions, even chapter two of the constitution was meant to address just that. Unfortunately, uh, because we're in this uh, reconciliatory mode, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, in fact, uh, uh, did not allow us to do things the way we would have wanted to do them. One of the things that happened was to say, even if we know so-and-so has offended X, then let's just forget about that. Let bygones be bygones, as it were. Unfortunately, some of the perpetrators assumed that, uh, in fact, uh, the people who have offended uh, have made peace with the fact that uh, we have offended them. So then in the post-1994 era, you find racism alive and well in South Africa. And you see this on a daily basis. There was a case, for instance, where uh, one of uh, the white business people um, well, well, did not even shy away from it. He was uh, speaking boldly about it, saying that uh, in my business, I cater for white people. And that is, a, uh, that is someone uh, who has um, a, a lodge. And then he said, I save white people. And that is in a democratic South Africa. Unfortunately, our laws are such that uh, you don't uh, just quickly go and shut that business. You have to follow a lengthy process. So that guy is still in business as we speak. And in another incident, you had uh, some two uh, white guys taking a black guy, putting him in a coffin, and then saying, we're going to kill you uh, because you don't respect white people. And then another one taking black people, painting them with paint, and then others, um, uh, in fact, uh, killing them. And then once they were apprehended, they said, no, we thought they were monkeys. So the reality of the matter then is as much as we as South Africans have uh, started that first journey towards recovery by uh, admitting that there is racism, in terms of uprooting it, I think we're too slow. And as a result, those who are on the receiving end, in some instances, they find themselves having to defend themselves as opposed to allowing state institutions to do that. Because government is saying, let us not bring back apartheid in its reverse form. In other words, if it was bad for the white government to oppress black, government, uh, black people, 
it is equally bad for a black government to oppress white people. So we're trying to massage racism as it were. So as a result, then we still have a problem. And I think there are similarities here uh, with America because uh, for the time uh, during my surgery in America, I was saying one of the reasons why you guys in America are not succeeding in uprooting racism is because we have made peace with it. In other words, we, we have admitted that uh, we are okay as we are. And in other words, we have not taken the first step uh, mm -hmm. towards uh, addressing racism. So uh, the long and short of it is that uh, in terms of legislation, we've tried our level best to approach um, racism, but in reality, racism is still alive and well. And unless it is addressed through state institutions, we might have a situation whereby those who are on the receiving end might end up taking law into their own hands and that is not what any one of us want. And it will be set, um, I mean, a set day for South Africa. Okay, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for that, Becky. Um, okay, uh, Adam, so now going back across to the North Atlantic, um, uh, Erica mentioned that Mexicans uh, like to think of the relationship with the United States as special. Um, I mentioned the relationship with Japan as a special <laughs> relationship. But you, of course, mentioned the one that's most often um, um, characterized as such. I mean, it's special not just in terms of how the two nations interface with one another, but how their politics often have a similar rhythm, um, a rhythm to it. And uh, the parallel is obviously the, the Brexit vote, a very surprising political outcome in 2016 happened at the same time to withdraw from the European Union, happened to, uh, just a few months before the election of Trump. Um, and then they both kind of came to an end, obviously not a complete end, but the Brexit deal um, was signed and delivered, was that in, in December, um, uh, just, as, just as President uh, Trump was slowly making his way out of the White House. So uh, my question for you is, as you step back and, and look at that trajectory, um, is the story here similar in, in the way this is play, these uh, things have played out in Britain and the United States, or do you see it as uh, moving in opposite directions? Well, um, there's a bit in me, Jay, that just for the sake of um, uh, just being contrary, want to kind of push back at the idea that Brexit and Trump are the, are the same phenomenon. I mean, you're, what, what you're saying is the is obviously so true in so many ways. And so many people made these parallels they did at the time. I mean, but, you know, um, the, 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 the notion of there being, you know, the, the left behinds, the people who, you know, felt overlooked by kind of near the neoliberal turn, so-called in modern politics, who were resentful of uh, immigration, which they felt was pushing down uh, wages, the people who kind of, thought that in the culture wars, which are so similar and yet in other ways different in Britain and the United States, they, you know, as kind of in the caricature, at least kind of white, um, you know, white men felt, well, I know I'm not privileged because I'm a white man because, you know, I left school at 16 and my wages have been going down in real, in relative terms for decades. And why should I may, be made to feel ashamed because of, you know, the legacy of empire in the British case or what, whatever it might be, right? And so that kind of resentment was brought to the surface. And all of that is right. I mean, there's all of, all of that is tr in terms of there being, in uh, terms of there being parallels. I mean, in other ways, I would say, um, you know, the, the one thing I suppose that I would pick, pick up on is you said that the, the Brexit vote was surprising. I mean, I admit to being surprised on the morning after the referendum, but it's very easy alternatively to make the case that the really surprising thing in retrospect about the referendum on British membership of the European Union was that the vote to leave wasn't much higher, right? I mean, and given the tortured, difficult history of Britain's relations with Europe and with the European Union and the trajectory that the European Union um, went in from the Maastricht Treaty of the 1990s onwards, you know, that there is, it's not difficult also to see as a historian looking back that the roots of the Brexit vote went back a very long way. Um, and at least more people voted for Brexit than against it, which of course was not true for Trump in 2016, yeah. any more than it was in 2020. Um, but your question is, have they been, um, well, you're right that they have been resolved, but Brexit will never really be resolved, right? Because the question of Britain's relationship to the European Union will 
be a, a, an issue for the rest of my lifetime and my kid's lifetime, I'm sure. And one consequence of Brexit may well be the final breakup of the United Kingdom, since it's it will trigger almost certainly uh, an independence referendum in Scotland, which if the polls are correct, will show that Scotland wants to leave the United Kingdom. And if Britain leaving the European Union is messy, then Scotland leaving a leaving the Union of the United Kingdom, that is going to be an absolute um, disaster um, in terms of the, the complicated mess that's going to be created when you end up creating a hard border, as you will have to do because of British Britain being out of the common market and the, uh, the, the single currency in there. And, and be out of the out of the uh, out of the European Union uh, and the single market, creating a hard border on this island. It's going to be an absolute mess. So Brexit will never end. Um, maybe Trumpism will 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 come back in some form or other. But Brexit's a much bigger, much more enduring, much more genuinely existential problem, or at least it's a symptom of an existential problem. Thanks. Thanks for that, Adam. And then uh, Fumiko, last last question before we open it up to, to you. To, I mean, surely one of the big underlying things that's happening globally right now is the, the rise of China, the rise of China that's altering um, the, the old geopolitical order and, and challenging the, the power of the United States and it's, it's just as its alliances are frying, fraying. Um, I, I wonder what you what you made about that and about in the Asian context in particular, um, the, the rise or reemergence, I suppose would be more accurate of, of these assertive forms of nationalism, assertive nationalisms in Asian. Perhaps that's one of the things you were alluding to in your earlier comments. Mm. Yeah, well, the problem of, of assertive nationalism uh, in Japan, uh, in South and North Korea, uh, and China is is indeed a big problem, and and this is a very difficult question to answer as well. Um, I am tempted to argue that um, assertive nationalism is is corro has corrosive effect on constitutional democracy uh, in two uh, by by uh, two two point, uh, <laughs> in two ways. Um, one is that it is uh, prone to encourage uh, chauvinism and, and also politically speaking authoritarianism uh, and infringe upon human rights and, and freedom of speech and, and publishing and so on. Um, the other is that um, assertive nationalism is often combined with militarism yeah. and, uh, and once a country adopts militarism uh, that can Spill, spill over uh, to the neighboring countries. That's probably what's happening in, in Asia uh, right now. So I'm, I'm tempted to say that assertive nationalism itself is a, is a, is a problem that uh, can destabilize uh, the area. And, and, and China's case is, is really, that fits into the pattern of this uh, 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 danger uh, by its suppression of democracy in Hong Kong and, and its Tibet response to the coup d'etat in, in Myanmar is, is a striking example. But at the same time, I don't think it's, it, it solves any problem by just saying that China is the only culprit in, in this situation. And the, the reason that I say is uh, this is that we have to, again, look into the, the historical context of what has happened in post-Cold War era, 30 years on, um, there was this, you know, two opposing forces of nationalism and internationalism or supranationalism in some, uh, some cases, and, and that which led to neoliberal economic uh, movement as well. And so, so there are a lot of centrifugal and, and centripetal uh, forces working on, and and that really uh, was that that movement happened when China was uh, going for economic liberalism, and at the same time um, 
trying to cover up the Tiananmen and then all this oppressive um, uh, political uh, events in, in its country. So, so we have to disentangle this uh, nationalism, yeah. uh, the historical background. And then also I should add, the, it, it, it coincided with the America's extremely unilateral policies of George W. Bush. So, so we have to put it into historical context. And then also uh, we have to, to put the rise of nationalism in, in global context as well. And um, f f talking about Japan, I would wish that as some uh, pundits have argued in the, uh, after the, the, right after the election of Trump, that Japan uh, would have played a role in, in upholding the, the, the idea of liberal democracy or liberal international order, but that, that was a, a very, very difficult thing for, for Japan to do, partly because, again, <laughs> this is the third country that claimed special relationship with the United States. Uh, Japan has been dependent on the United States, uh, primarily militarily, and whether it's Trump or Obama, uh, it doesn't make this difference. The, the Japanese government has to be loyal to, to the US in order to maintain this relationship. And that really um, deprives Japanese ability to, to, to stand up to whatever ha is happening to, to in, in Asian countries, especially this uh, abuse of human rights and um, suppression of democracy. Uh, because, because the the primary thing for Japan is to to maintain the U.S. Japanese relationship, so so that is a, a sad story about my own country uh, that it 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 can syn <laughs> synchronize its foreign policy with the United States, but uh, it cannot really uh, be independent uh, of of the United States in order to 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 be. Uh, to maintain the, the special relationship. And then that's a very militaristic uh, alliance rather than the, the alliance of value, values or um, glo some gl global ideas. That's okay, Th thanks for that. And now we're gonna, we're gonna run into the questions, everybody, let's dive in. Um, we're, Cindy and I are gonna alternate. Uh, the first one here, this one for anyone who wants to answer it, uh, Kathy Kiley, a big uh, journalism professor here, has asked about the role of the media, the way in which um, re reporters have been targeted um, in the United States and, and beyond, um, and then also how the um, those challenging, I suppose, uh, some constitutional norms have uh, very deftly deployed the, the new uh, forms of social media. Um, do, do you see this playing out um, in similar ways where, where you sit or what, what, what's the story here? Who, who wants to take this one? I'm, I'm happy to have a go, Jay. Um, the, uh, I think of all of the developments that have happened in American politics, I would say that the demonization of the media and the visibility of the attacks on the media, for example, in the January the 6th insurrection or whatever it was, the storming of the Capitol are among the most uh, anxiety producing. And if it is the case, as people often imagine it is uh, in this country, that Britain is always just a few steps behind the United States going in the same direction, then that's probably the most worrying precedent. One thing that Britain at the moment has that the United States doesn't have is the BBC, which remains still um, uh, a national institution and a genuinely national institution, in other words, encompassing all of the nations of the United Kingdom, um, that um, has a, a duty to be um, impartial. Uh, what that in practice means is that it's attacked from all sides, but the BBC not unreasonably uh, takes that as a mark of its uh, success. Now, I'm not, you know, here to kind of defend the BBC in all of its ins and outs, um, but um, I do think it's an incredibly one of the few 
ways in which British democratic political culture is sustained through the presence of the BBC. And so the fact the BBC is now under serious assault from the current Conservative government and that there are plans to abolish the impartiality rules for British broadcasting in general in the way that the impartiality rules for television broadcasting in the United States were abolished in wherever it was in the 80s, 80s. In the Reagan era, um, is really is really quite chilling. Because in terms of your initial framing of this discussion, Jay, about polarization, the fact that Americans are living in separate partisan bubbles, that's to an extent less true here, in large part because of broadcasting, from which which is still the place where most people get their news and their views of the world despite social media. Um, and so if that goes, then I think then I think we're really in trouble. Yeah, I, I um, the the problem of the pressure uh, of upon media by the government to report what they want the, the, in the way that they want want it reported is is very strong in Japan, and and I think the journalists are struggling to uh, to be independent of the political pressure, and then also the social uh, pressure as well. Although not in again the blatant way that it's uh, playing out in in the United States, but but there there are many problems. Um, the the government can be very specific about certain programs that are uh, that they consider anti-government, um, and then the the media, uh, the social media in in some cases uh, they they don't trust the elites. And the media is considered uh, one of the, the establishment and the elites, so they don't trust the the, um, the reporting of certain newspapers and, and certain TV stations and so on. But but also there is a problem within the media as well. Uh, I, I think it is well known that Jap Japanese media is very well controlled by themselves. Uh, so, so when they ask questions, they have a representative asking questions and, and there are certain medias that are limited um, in, in participating on, in the, the press conferences and, and some independent, independent journalists are struggle, struggling to get through that uh, constraint. So, so, so the problems are many and, and it's true. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, in Japan, things are playing out quite quietly, but the, the direction that it's going is not so different from what's happening in the United States or maybe in Britain as well. Uh, Jay, yeah, in the South African context, I think that uh, the media is operating freely. A as a matter of fact, uh, you will find that uh, a journalist would invoke certain pieces of legislation whenever they feel that uh, their rights uh, are being infringed upon by some politicians. There was a case, for instance, when um, uh, the late President Mugabe visited South Africa, and then when he was interviewed uh, by a white journalist, uh, he basically told the journalist point blank, I don't want to be interviewed by a white person. This did not go down well with the uh, the South African media houses because they were saying that uh, it's our job, that's what we do, and we do it well. In the South African context, what normally happens is uh, you will find that some of the reporters uh, might seem to be biased towards certain politicians and against others, but there is no attempt to stop them from doing that. All that happens is that uh, there is caution being uh, sent out that uh, uh, you have the freedom use it, but don't abuse it. Because there is a sense, for example, on many occasions you'll hear people say that uh, uh, the media is protecting the current president when it was uh, in fact uh, um, uh, against the former president Zuma. You will always find that, but generally speaking, uh, me, the, the, the media is allowed to operate in South Africa freely. And unlike in other African countries where during an election, uh, you will have social media being cut out you'll have uh, the internet being cut out. We never hear something of that sort because uh, it's known that uh, most of these um, uh, journalists, they rely in fact on social media to 
uh, circulate or disseminate information, and they do that with relative ease. So I would say, by and large, uh, the media freedom in South Africa is guaranteed, at least uh, so far. Thank you. Erica, please, did you want to jump in? Quickly, um, I, I think the media operating freely uh, is essentially a good thing, but I don't think the problem in Mexico, it, it, Mexico is one of the most uh, dangerous countries to be a journalist, not so much because of political power, which has now taken it upon himself, upon itself to um, call them liars and uh, saying that they have been bought, etc. But I think that that is actually less important than the fact that they are often the targets of organized crime. Uh, I think the problem is one of civil society being uncivil societies in plural, that everyone can have their own truth. And I don't really see how um, they, we're going to resolve this. Uh, this is, I, if we had everyone got their own BBC, that would be great. But I don't think that that would, would solve the problem. And it goes to the heart of what Fumiko was saying at the beginning. Uh, if there is no common ground as to what is legitimate, what will hold up um, you know, reasonable discourse, the rule of law, et cetera. So I think that that is a danger throughout all, all of our countries. Okay, great. We have a lot of questions here. And here at the Kinder Institute, we always like to ask student questions. So I'm gonna to turn to uh, Brendan Durbin, who's one of the undergraduate fellows here at the Kinder Institute. Um, and he asks a question to Fumiko and to Erica. So I'll ask both and then they can respond in kind. Um, first to Fumiko, what is the general perception of the brand of right-wing populism publicly supported by Donald Trump, Josh Hawley, and Ted Cruz? Are there factions within the LDP shifting towards similar policies or rhetoric? And are there any characteristics of Japanese conservative politics that may offer an example for those American conservatives who oppose right-wing populism that they can maybe emulate from a Japanese example? Um, to Erica, um, are there historical parallels between the PRI prior to electoral reforms or anti-corruption initiatives and the behavior of the Republican Party? Um, so do I go first? Um, that, that's a great question and, and, and actually a difficult one to answer. Um, um, the, there is a, among Japanese conservatives uh, that liked Trump, uh, the way that he was again telling it as, as like it was and, and, and he was straightforward, um, he reciprocated loyalty to loyalty. So, so uh, for example, Prime Minister Abe was very uh, happy with the relationship that he established with, with Trump with considerable effort on his side as well. So, so um, in a way, the, the ODP party was more, uh, I think they, they felt more comfortable with Trump administration than President Obama. Uh, who was more uh, uh, more intellectual? I mean, who who wanted to to talk reason and and uh, was not prone to personal relationship. But but having said that, I don't think the the majority of the LDP espoused the, the language of uh, uh, of the the Trump uh, extreme Trump supporters and the. Uh, and the, the people like Ted Cruz and, and all those people who uh, had uh, disavowed or this uh, who who refused to to accept the, uh, the the result of the election and there's a line still that divide the, the two um, among the SNS among SNS and and uh, and some some very uh, small rightist groups, there is supporters of Trump. And, and I think that what connects them is, is really the, the style of nationalism and populism, uh, populism as you say, um, that, that somehow appeal to their uh, sense of uh, 
belonging and, and identity and so on. Uh, beyond that, I'm not quite sure how, how that uh, the tie is, is made up uh, from. Um, I should I oh, I'm I'm not sure I'm getting this right. Do you mean the PRI before the democratic transition or before anti um, anti uh, corruption legislation? Because there's been anti corruption legislation <laughs> at least since the since the since the late seventies. Not that it's worked very well, but uh, but. If, if you mean the PRI before uh, or during the, the democratic transition, I would say there is some, there are some rhetorical similarities in this um, appeal to the nation um, which sees the truth and which is getting all these either elites or enemies of the revolution or, trying to pull the wool over, over their eyes and the, the PRI speaking for, um, for the, the real nation and its real interests uh, above, uh, you know, dark, dark, um, dark motives of, of minorities. There is a huge difference though, in that you had a PRI who controlled um, the electoral machinery to uh, you know the degree almost of perfection. So these this rhetoric had an effect that was that was you know people would get excited or would be shocked or would be offended, but it wouldn't provoke um, a reaction that would that would weigh on electoral results, which I think is, I think that this exploitation of grievances from the Republican party of today um, is, contributes to volatility, contributes to polarization and contributes to uh, maybe warping an electoral system that it will, apparently become increasingly, increasingly gerrymandered, increasingly um, uh, supp suppressive, that, we'll, that, that we will have more voter suppression. So the tone might have been similar, but I think the effects are very different. Okay, I've got, a, I've got a great question here from Abby Statina. Um, and let's just do a, a quick hitter, like do, go around the horn real quick. Abby asks, um, what, you know, thanks for speaking with us, but what, what question, what news story from where you sit um, should American college students pay attention to? Who wants to start that one off? I mean, maybe it's one of the, such, such a good question that it stumps everybody, but it's a really good one as Americans are sort of trying to, trying to take in more um, international news, but not really knowing where to start. Where would you point them? Um, in, in your neck of the woods? What's a story that they need to be following? Um, Becky or Adam want to start us off? We'll go around the horn. Becky? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think that uh, there, there are a number of questions. One of them could be uh, for them to uh, ask the question, where do they want to see America uh, in the space of multilateralism? Because I think that is the point of contention. Uh, under the Obama uh, administration, uh, we saw him mending the walls as it were uh, with a number of countries that were not friendly uh, to the US and vice versa, uh, your North Korea or Cuba and the like. And then under the Trump administration, we saw a reversal thereof. Uh, and then of course that uh, uh, shapes America's foreign policy posture. So basically the key question then would be, what kind of a, a foreign policy post, a posture uh, would they want America to take? And then also uh, what space would they uh, want um, America to occupy in multilateralism? Because if you have these multilateral institutions uh, that are trying to bring uh, international order as it were, uh, with America playing one of the leading roles, 
then uh, you have uh, an incumbent president uh, who threatens those multilateral institutions. Then does that help Americans or does it do the opposite? For example, if you say that uh, you are going to withdraw funding uh, to a multilateral body, how does that paint America? And then how does it contribute uh, to multilateralism? Because then what you do uh, by, by, by doing that or by not doing it, you either end respect or you lose it. I think for me, those are the kinds of questions they should be asking. It's, not, it's more than one. I've given more than one. But it's a good one. And of course, the international distribution of the vaccine might be one specific a manifestation of that issue about multilateralism that could be confronted immediately. Um, what, what else? Adam, what, what, what do you think? American um, which news stories should they be following in, in 2021, 22? They should be following the, uh, they should take an interest in, in German politics. Um, the successor to Angela Merkel is going to make a very big difference uh, to yeah. Europe and therefore to the world. And 2022 is the next French presidential election. That could be a bloody and um, potentially pretty nasty affair as well. Um, you know, the whole future of Europe is creaking uh, in, in and, and, and uncertain in multiple ways. And um, I think probably that would be my tip for American college students is just kind of read The Economist or something on what's, what, what's going on in some big important European powers by which I do not include the United Kingdom. Another major British institution, the BBC, now The Economist. Uh, next, you're going to be talking about the NHS. Um, uh, Fubico, Erica, do you want to add anything for what college students should be looking for? Um, I think basically immigration, uh, just not just from Mexico, but from, from Central America. And uh, will we be able, as, as, as nations, to come up with a solution that is safe, that is control, I mean, control that we know who is moving uh, and, and going and going where, uh, because I think that that is, I, I would agree with Becky, it's a test of, of we, we know we live in one world, we know we have all these problems which are not, you know, do not stop at borders. Can we, what, what is it that we can do to, to resolve them? And um, the problem is there. Uh, what will we find a solution uh, together? Okay, <laughs> I, I will be true to myself and and <laughs> to urge uh, people to look at uh, look for dissent, um, dissent left or right, uh, non-violent. I think violent dissent is covered too much, uh, but. Nonviolent dissent can be forgotten, um, won't, won't be the headlines. Uh, but, but I think the, the nationalism and in America's case, excep exceptionalism is always the key to, to what, what's going to happen uh, in the future. But, but at the same time, don't forget to look at the dissent that's, that's simmering and um, trying to, to raise their voices. Okay, let's turn to a question that I think will involve multiple panelists from Professor Reeve Huston. Um, he writes, I think that Adam has answered this question for Britain, but I'd like to know how recent political developments in the US has affected how important the US figures in the political and geopolitical thinking of Mexicans, Japanese, and South Africans. Is the U.S. appearing as less an example, less powerful, even less exceptional? Would you like me to start? That would be great. Thank you. Uh, oh, I think that for me me for Mexicans, the U.S. is like the neighbor um, who lives upstairs that you really, really, really like his apartment and you might want to move in, but you don't really trust him. And he is kind of mean when you meet him on the stairwell. Um, so I don't think the US seems, I, I don't think we were convinced about the US being that exceptional um, to, for starters. And there's this, double, you know, democracy for me, but not for thee, 
tradition, which which Mexicans have always been a little bit more skeptical about the US as a political model. Um, but I do think that one of the things that we have learned from the Trump presidency is that things can really get a lot worse. And that what we need is to have these institutions that take the bilateral relationship outside of politics. The free trade agreements, both of them, the, the NAFTA served this purpose, the new one will probably uh, be able to do that too. So that the, this very problematic, very dense, very uh, inescapable relationship can be managed outside of the whims of politicians trying to get votes. Uh, let me let let me come in. I think that uh, from a South African perspective, I think that it would be unfair uh, to judge Americans by what has happened under the Trump administration. Uh, because uh, a lot of things have happened which other countries have wanted to uh, follow through. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, as much as America embraces uh, multi-party democracy, but we don't have too many parties. Uh, you have uh, the Democrats, you have the Republicans, and then once in a while, you have the Green Party. And in fact, I for one in South Africa have been saying that uh, in South Africa, we need only three political parties, uh, the governing party, the opposition party, and the kingmaker, then it will be fine. So for quite a long time, I was happy with that because in 1994, we had 14 political parties and that is when we had our first democratic election. And then over the years, they've increased to over 200. And I was asking myself the question, what on earth is going on here? Can you find a party that you can align yourself with? So basically that is one good thing you can take. But then one thing that uh, South Africans are not happy about is this post-election violence. Because we've been complaining about this uh, across the continent that after you have lost an election, uh, you must just concede, step aside. And then after uh, that particular administration, if you want to come back, you can do so. So that is one thing South Africans don't want to copy from America, that of uh, refusing to leave office. Because if it was an African country, I was saying in another media house here in South Africa that uh, if this had happened in another country, uh, that country would be threatened with sanctions. But because it happened in America, no one is talking about sanctions. So basically I, I'm saying that uh, there is something good we can take from America and there is something bad we can take. That's why at the beginning I said, America has dropped ball, but then it's up to President Biden to pick up the ball and run with it. So there is still hope that America can go back and do the right thing. Then it depends on what happens from now onwards. Then we can judge America fairly. Thank you. Okay, I'm mindful that for some of you, it's getting super late. We're gonna have a couple more, two more questions. We're going to try to wrap this up um, as, as soon as opposed to later. Um, this has just been fantastic. Um, I want to move to uh, Victor McFarland's question about climate diplomacy, the United States re-entering the Paris uh, Climate Accord. Um, uh, he's just inviting comments on that and how, how that's going down outside of the United States. And if one um, sees this um, as cause for, for optimism on the, on the climate issue. Fumika, did you, did you want to say that or did you want to pick up on something else? You know, I, I just wanted to add the, to the answer the last question, is it, if yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Because um, I, I think in Japan, um, as, as I mentioned at, at the beginning, I, I, the perception of the United States is conflicted. I mean, there's always this allure of the United States, but, but at the same time, um, there's a, a lot of opposition against the bases and then all the militaristic um, uh, pressure uh, on, on, on Japan as well. But ironically, I have to say that the dependency on the United States has increased uh, politically and militarily, despite those ambivalences, because because Japan hasn't established good relations with China or South Korea or North Korea for that matter. Um, so, so there's this increasing pressure to be 
this, the, to maintain the, this close relationship with the United States. And that, that was something that I wanted to answer. Um, as to the climate uh, thing, I, I think, generally speaking, the, pub, the public and the, the media to are welcoming uh, United States coming back to the, to the international, uh, the, the, the climate accords. Your thoughts on climate change? Um, well, I've, I've got plenty of thoughts on it. I mean, it, it's obviously the most uh, um, pressing, uh, you know, one of the, the most pressing global issues and um, is one which uh, desperately, desperately, desperately needs United States leadership. You know, I mean, it, it, it's it, we, as we've seen for the last four years, um, when the United States abdicates its leadership role in this issue, um, it's just incredibly difficult to get any uh, movement from those countries which 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 where, where action is most necessary. And um, so I think one of the many reasons why most of the world, um, including certainly Britain, most people in Britain, the vast majority sighed a big sigh of relief when Trump left office was precisely um, over this issue. And, and it should be noted as well, I mean, from the from, you know, thinking about your question from the perspective of Missouri college students in in most parts of the world, including in Britain, this is not a partisan issue in the way that it is in the United States. Right. So yeah. conservatives, right wing politicians in Britain are not climate change deniers. I mean, a few of them are. There are a few bonkers people everywhere, but this is not a party issue in the way that it's become in the United States. Yeah, no, I think th that one is a very uh, important uh, development because uh, uh, in South Africa in particular and in Africa in general, there's been a concern that uh, the continent is not the biggest uh, emitter of uh, carbon uh, dioxide. And uh, in fact, it's contributing very little uh, in terms of uh, uh, this uh, global warming but then uh, we are paying the price as a continent and, and of course as a country. So when countries like America uh, under the uh, Trump administration pulled out, this was in fact seen as uh, uh, being, uh, I would say uh, basically not doing justice to the globe, not necessarily to any particular continent, but not doing justice to the globe. Uh, and not only because America is one of the pow um, uh, powerhouses, but also because it emits um, uh, these carbon gases that uh, uh, in fact affect the environment. But also secondly, because uh, uh, America is the financial muscle to assist in addressing the issue. So then with America stepping aside or pulling out, that uh, in fact uh, was a cause dent in the fight against climate change. So with America coming back, that, is, uh, that brings a glimmer of hope that we might be headed somewhere. So it's well welcomed not just by South Africans, but by Africans in general. Thank you. Okay, so let's turn to a question by one of our graduate students, um, Ian DeBoer. I'm gonna summarize his question here. Um, he's turning to the provocative and direct language that was used by the former president. Um, and he asks about the ways in which it might speak directly to his supporters and how much does the 2020 election um, map onto these issues of unbridled, unregulated, internationally influential social media corporations like Facebook and Twitter. Um, is there any way we can address them globally um, or even begin to talk about the role of censorship or social media um, in elections? Um, I, I think, I think the the social media tend to encourage people speaking with each other and, and that really escalates the language of the extremes or, or the, the circulation of fake news. But coming, but one thing that was striking, I think, and then you have to draw a line there, is that it came from the president, the, 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 the top authority in, in the United States and, and possibly globally, global authority. And, and that, that really changed the, the whole picture. And, and we, we can't normalize that, I think. Um, and that hasn't happened in Japan uh, yet, at least.
Yeah, I don't know what the answer to the, I mean, it's obviously one of the big issues facing, I mean, you know, political scientists, historians, other commentators talk all the time now about um, you know, uh, the um, global crisis of liberal democracy and, 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 and a big part of that uh, story is the transformation in the nature of the media. Of course, um, you know, democracy, as we understand it, is a very recent and and probably very fragile experiment in social and political organization. It wouldn't be particularly astonishing if new forms of um, organizing knowledge, as well as increasing global tensions, um, undermine it even further. But on the other hand, you know, um, liberal democracies have survived transformations in the media before, right, the rise of um, uh, television, radio, and uh, it would seem to me that this is one area that really should be within our capability as societies to um, overcome. But once again, because of the nature of the internet, I'm afraid it really is down to the United States to take a lead. It just isn't possible um, for any other individual country or even, I mean, the European Union has, you know, tried in various ways um, to hold, uh, you know, Facebook, or Twitter or whatever to account. But nobody can do it as well as the United States government can do it. That's just the reality of the world. Um, you know, China can control the internet to some extent within China, right? So, you know, but but that's a that's a different that's a different question, and that's at, at, at other at a massive cost as well in terms of the, the nature of the political system. Uh, for me, I, I would say that uh, it takes two to tango. So you have those who are in power who can decide whether to censor the media or not. And then you have those who are using the media. So if we, if we use the media responsibly, there will be no reason, no reason to censor it. And those who are in power, if they use their power to censor the media, then that becomes undemocratic. So basically, uh, if we are, want to address this issue, we have to look at it from both ends. Uh, for example, if you have a president discussing uh, issues of national security in the media, then there is a problem. Similarly, if you have uh, the members of, members of the general public uh, spreading fake news using the media, that is also a problem. So I think that uh, if we want to uh, use media within the democratic ethos, we have to make sure that uh, we abide by the rules and to make sure that we don't put our countries uh, in danger. Because uh, uh, it wouldn't help to say, okay, we have media freedom and we can say whatever we want to say. Then we take sensitive uh, information that is supposed to protect our national security and then we put it out there because by so doing, we're exposing our country. And at the same time, if we're in power and then we use our power to use the media the way we want, then it becomes a problem. I would say we have to, to look at it uh, from both ends. Thank you. No, I would just say that it, it is one of the great uh, issues that need to be resolved. I also think that there that it is a space for opportunity because we we have seen the uh, bad things that happen with fake information, with fake information coming from authority figures. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that it is worldwide, uh, we can see experiments going on around us. And I think that that really feeds into a discussion that where there is there shouldn't be a dominant actor uh, although I agree with, with Adam that, that the US has to play a leadership role, but that it won't be just governments deciding to shut down, but governments looking at what other governments are doing and you know, interested parties in, in civil society also uh, taking on assertive roles. So uh, it will be a very interesting couple of years, I think, for that in, in that in that realm. Okay, everyone. Um, well, we haven't solved all the problems tonight. Um, in fact, I'm not sure we solved any, but we got a good start, at least identifying them. And um, as I thank our speakers for, for staying up super late or, or getting up super early, I just want to say I was thinking all this talk about special relationships between the United States and different countries. And to the extent which that's ever been true, 
Um, uh, my view is it's not because of, of government institutions and organizations or military hardware and partnerships. Um, it's because of people to people um, encounters. Um, so I'm very grateful to each and every one of you for taking your time, sharing it um, uh, with, with, with us here at the University of Missouri, sharing your wisdom with our students, giving them a sort of sense of what a, a, the special relationships might mean moving forward. I hope we can do it again. I hope we can do it in the post pandemic world okay so we don't got to do the zoom we have to do the zoom stuff we can do it um in person and have a proper celebration afterwards um we if we could all clap for you we would be doing that uh, but just know that on behalf of all of our listeners thank you all very much um thank you cindy um, and allison uh, and everyone else who made this possible and uh, have a good have a good weekend everyone thank you jay